really like the idea of developing as much joy in your life as you can possibly develop. Because joy is one of the enlightenment factors. You aren't going to become awake, truly awake, with a mind that's heavy with emotional nonsense. The only way your mind is going to be truly awake is if you have joy in your mind. Joy is a balancing factor on the spiritual path. And this is really weird, you know? I've been on the spiritual path for 35, 40 years, something like that. I've been practicing meditation for about 35 years. And in that time, nobody ever told me that it was all right to be happy, and it's all right to smile, and it's all right to laugh, and that these were factors of awakening. Nobody ever told me that. I had to figure it out on my own. The first 20 years of my meditation was serious. I mean, I went and did meditation retreats. I did many meditation retreats. A lot of times, the kind of meditation that uh, I started with was a Burmese style of meditation. And when you came and did a retreat, you did it for one month. That means from 4 o'clock in the morning until 11 o'clock at night, you're doing the meditation, then you take some sleep and start all over again. And your mind gets very serious when you do this. You're really trying hard. Now, I've done a lot of one-month retreats. I've done a lot of three-month retreats. For three months, that's a long time. And... I went when, when I went to Burma, my first time, I was there for eight months. And I did an eight-month retreat. And then I got kicked out of Burma because they were, they were uh, having a lot of social unrest and they were shooting people and they didn't want foreigners in the country. So they told us we had to leave. And it took me well over a year to get a visa to go back into the country. But when I finally got back into the country, I did a two-year retreat. Now, this was intensive meditation. Nobody in all of that time told me that it was all right to smile and be happy and have fun doing this. I was serious. I experienced everything that they said I was supposed to experience and become enlightened. But I wasn't satisfied with that. There's something that was missing. So when I got, I left Burma and I went back to Malaysia. And before I'd gone into Burma, I had started a monastery. And they asked me to come back and take over at that monastery and they wanted me to teach this Burmese style of meditation because I'd spent so long doing it. And I wasn't willing to do that anymore. That's when I started teaching everybody about loving kindness. And when you do the Burmese style of meditation, I mean, you try. You really try. And you never smile. And you're supposed to practice uh, noble silence, which means you don't talk to anybody but the teacher. When people would get done doing a meditation like that, they would spend their time when the retreat was over talking about how hard the meditation was, 
how much pain there was in the meditation, and whether they really did the meditation correctly or not. When I let go of that method, what I did was I started going back to the original teachings, and I found that the, the instructions were different. And they left out a major part of the instructions, and that major part is the relaxing of the tension and tightness. Now, I was doing mindfulness of breathing meditation, and it says in the in the book it says you relax on the in breath and you relax on the out breath. Your mind gets distracted, you let it be, you relax. You come back to your breath, on the in-breath relax, on the out-breath relax. They left the relaxed state out. Now, what does this do? Craving is the cause of suffering. It's the cause of pain. What is craving? Craving is the I like it, I don't like it mind. And craving always manifests as tension and tightness in your mind and in your body. Now, if you leave that step out of relaxing, what are you doing? You're saying that that craving is going to stay there. So you're never really going to learn how to relax into things. Eventually, you get to a point of concentration where a lot of the tensions and tightnesses will appear to go away, but they're not really. You just ignore them. But when I started going back and I started reading this, I had a lot of major res uh, revelations about they didn't teach us what the Buddha was teaching. And I started doing this mindfulness of breathing on my own. You know, I'd just been asked uh, when I really started getting into looking at the suttas, I'd just been asked to go to the biggest monastery in Kuala Lumpur. And the teacher there, he was an amazing monk. He'd been there for, he'd been teaching at that place for 45 years. And he gave absolutely brilliant talks, but they were kind of general talks. They didn't specifically talk about meditation. So he asked me to come in and teach meditation. And Every other week, I would give a Dhamma talk. Every Friday, he gave a talk. Every Friday, between three and 500 people would come and listen to this talk. So every other week, I'm, doing, I'm taking over for him. So I got real used to talking in front of big crowds. Talking in front of lots of people doesn't bother me one way or the other. And... As I started seeing the real differences between what was being practiced and what the Buddha was teaching, I decided, you know, this is great stuff. I'm going to take a couple of weeks off, even though I just got to this monastery, and I'm going to do the meditation. So I left there, and I went to Thailand. And I found a cave, and this cave happened to have a cobra living in it. Cobra as in snake. Oh, as in snake. <laughs> but it was it was a big it was a big cave. I mean, it was huge, and it was real high ceiling. It could rain, and I never would get wet. I mean, it was it was it was not a dark, dingy place. And I made peace with the cobra, and I told him that it. We'd withdraw a line here, and I'll stay on this side of the line, and you stay on that side of the line. We'll get along fine. And I would occasionally, when I would eat food, I'd throw in some food. So we got to be friends. And any time I got too close to him, he would 
like that. And I'd go, oh, sorry, and back away. Now, this was a great relationship because he kept the rats and the mice away from my stuff. <laughs> so we got to be real good friends. Anyway, I started meditating, and after two weeks, it was so incredibly different and interesting that I didn't want to stop. So I kept going. And after three months, the head monk at the, at the temple in Kuala Lumpur sent somebody to come get me. <laughs> can't, can't be, you can't be away so long. Now you've got to come back. <laughs> But I was teaching loving-kindness meditation at this time. And what I noticed is people would come and they would do a four-day retreat or a one-week retreat. When they got off the retreat, they were really happy. They were radiant and smiling. And they were talking about how much fun they had doing it and how easy it was and how they didn't want to stop. Now, that's a little bit different from the other kind of meditation, where they're talking about how hard it was, how painful it was. So I started noticing, hmm, this meditation's really got some good potential, doesn't it? 